Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the original Loretta Brown Show, radio to open the heart, heal the soul, and awaken the consciousness. Good morning, Mr. Benny Mathers. How hello, are you? Hello. Oh. Doing very well. Are you feeling this warm weather? I am feeling, I'm fe- like, oh, 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 so good. I know, right? I know. Yeah. I um, I saw that it's going to be great today, and then again, even warmer tomorrow. And I'm so ready. It's I'm all for so me. Good. I did what I could for you. Oh. I extended it to the weekend, and you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I knew you had the power to do it. Thank you. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I I don't know. I don't want to start out all grumping. But I am just so glad that the sun is coming out and, mm-hmm. and it'll just lift all of our spirits. Yeah, it's yeah. all that vitamin D. It's that good energy. Yeah. And please, everybody, get out in it. Do something fun. Yes. And um, yeah. Yeah. I'll say sure. this. Turn off these little guys for just a little yes. bit and then go enjoy it. That's yes. One, that's that's your order. That's your that's uh, right. prescription for the weekend. Yeah. You're, you could just have nature in front of your eyes or you know, your kids or, you know, your dogs or the sun or something, yep. you know, just a little bit of a different thing. So yeah, mm-hmm. definitely take some time to yourself. So uh, I am Loretta Brown, owner of Reiki Oasis, located right here in the greater Seattle area. And a couple of reminders and a big thank you. Uh, thank you. Shout out to my patrons. Thank you. We're listener supported show. And I keep saying there's going to be new things there and there are going to be. Um, I have a couple of things coming up. Sunday meditation with Loretta. We're not going to do it every Sunday. It will be the first Sunday of every month and it might be another Sunday. So just kind of keep, get on the email list and take a look at that and see what's going on. And then, um, I do have a class for women coming up in May temple of the divine feminine. And you can find out about all that at schedule.reikioasis.com. So I want to talk a little bit about astrology Whoo! I want to know if everybody has felt a shift since last week when we had the um, Aries new moon solar eclipse on April 20th. And boy, did I, I've really felt it. And the start of eclipse season, we're kind of halfway through the middle. We got another eclipse coming up uh, May 5th, which will be a full moon lunar eclipse in Scorpio. And even though it's in Scorpio, I kind of feel like it's going to maybe, I don't know, is that I'm going to say it's going to settle things down. But my goodness, with Mercury going retrograde and those eclipses, life has kind of uh, gotten all over the place, at least for me. And uh, we're just going to hope it keeps moving forward. Currently, we're in Taurus, the the, uh, sign of Taurus, which is an Earth sign. Many planets are in Taurus. We had many planets in Aries. Now we're in Taurus. We have the sun in Taurus, Mercury retrograde in Taurus, Uranus in Taurus, and the North Node also in Taurus. And uh, Taurus is about slowing down, enjoying life, enjoying the pleasures and comforts of life. And so here we are. We have some beautiful weather giving us the ability to enjoy the sunshine and what it has to offer. Maybe it will lift our moods. But Taurus is about food, security, comforts, the arts, music, money, our health, and what is natural, the natural world. So with Mercury retrograde, maybe you're having some things come up around all those things I just mentioned. And until May 21st, which is, that's the whole length of of Taurus season, this is the time to connect with Mother Earth natural living, natural ways of doing things. And um, I don't know, kind of coming back center. Since Pluto entered Aquarius, we've been seeing a lot of information about the advancement of technology. Um, There's been, I don't know, a lot of my clients, I always kind of take the temperature of things by what's going on with my clients. People are just unsettled. There's this unsettled feeling. So Scorpio is our south node. It rules fear and the dark side of life. And so as we've got the north node in Taurus, we've got the south node in Scorpio. And I want to remind people, 
that the North Node is our destiny. It is the direction that we are going. And we should always be focusing on the direction we're going, which is positive. And remember that the South Node or those places of darkness and fear are behind us at some level. So I don't know, we are that 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 part of the of the whole you know reality that how we think and how we act and what we bring forward is really very um, important. So take care of your health, take care of your families, take a look at your money. Right now is a really great time to get your money in order. Um, around us in the world, we may be saying, seeing bits and pieces of information about money, the financial system, Mercury retrograde in Taurus rules information, facts, social media. There could be a lot of information out there, which we know that there is. And so it might be a good time to also take a social media detox, which Mr. Benny Mathers brought up because he is so in tune with it, Benny. Woo! Why, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, you're welcome. So take time in nature. And um, I don't know, sometimes we just don't need to watch all that stuff. Um, do something fun. Uh, and then on May 1st, we have something coming up called a Mercury Cazini. A Cazini. And it's not a food. It's where a planet, a Kazemi is where a planet is conjunct the sun. And this one has Mercury. So it's going to highlight Mercury. It's a magical day to receive messages, epiphanies, downloads, insights, and truths. And this Kazemi is at 11 degrees, which is known as the Aquarian degree. And so it's a really good day to pay attention to what is going to be revealed that day in the collective world events. So this on um, this day, Pluto rec retrogrades into Aquarius until October 11th, and it's just going to kind of revisit a whole bunch of stuff. And um, so yep, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Life is marching on. Here we go. So with all of that background, it's actually a great background to have my guest today, who is the amazing Carl David Blake. I've had him on my show before, and he's wonderful. You're going to you're going to love him. He's a film director, a producer, a Guinness World Record holder, was a professor of college English and communications, and a best-selling author of several books, to include his latest book, Engine A, The Most Powerful Woman Who Ever Lived. Verbally passed down among the most elite European scholars, but never recorded in the written word. Carl David Blake brings the French medieval story of Angene to the world. And the book not only brings an in-depth look at France during the Dark Ages and the emergence of a very powerful woman, but connects this event to current world events with the story of four young legal eagles who get together for a quote-unquote innocent time of partying and getting away. And oops, how'd we do that? They cast a hellacious demonic spell and conjure up some things that, well, you should just get the book. It is riveting. <laughs> Carl, thank you for coming to my show today. Thank oh my you, Loretta. Goodness. So this, you know, I've interviewed you before, and I think we talked about a quantum activation or something. Right, something. Right, correct. Something, very different. <laughs> and you, you, I changed the channel with this book and was riveted. Uh, would you please give us a, some background as to what led to the writing of this book? Yeah. This, yeah, this was very weird. I, I tell people now that um, this happened, you know, before COVID. Now, BC is no longer before Christ. It's before COVID. <laughs> yes, it is, by the way. <laughs> it's a new time period. Really. Could, wait, Carl. It could also be before Carl and after Carl. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah, I'm, for I'm just sure. teasing you. I'm, I'm yeah. just teasing you. Um, uh, yeah. th that, that was uh, the, uh, I would say the genesis of this book came. I didn't want to write it, actually. What happened was. I had this horror film called Unprotected. I was ready to direct it. I was ready to get funding and everything. And it was so evil that my editors had problems reading it. 
That's how, oh. yeah. Where the one that you, that, that's the beginning of this Andre book. And it was, I was trying to drive for some reason, you know, you're trying to get this thing done. It couldn't get done. I'm just grinding, 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 grinding. And then COVID hit and a, a really famous uh, director told me, write the book, write the book. So a screenplay is about one half to one third of a book, a book, uh, the novel's about two to three times as long. So I'm like, what do I do? So I had the entrepreneur book started and I'm like, I'm going to connect these because this is so relevant because there's these four powerful attorneys, you, you know, doing what they're doing, <laughs> running off the, uh, the moral path there. And <laughs> quite it, a bit. <laughs> yeah. And that spell is a real spell. I warn people do not. Go yes, it is. Do not do not do this. I consulted with several people. That's not that's not just some gimmick. I, I said, I don't want any spiritual entanglements. So the story of Anjane, I didn't, this sounds almost embarrassing for me, is I wasn't a, into religion, organized religion very much. And this girl was, you know, a Christian. She was, I, there were no Christians before the Reformation. They were all Catholic. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But when, but it just connected. It just connected. When this, the, the professor of literature, I was in Florida, and I asked him at, a, at an event, I was, I was an undergraduate, I was an undergraduate in biology, not literature. <laughs> so when I asked him who his favorite character of all time was, out of everything, religion, philosophy, arts, um, uh, uh, history, who's his favorite character? And he goes, Anjane. I'm like, who's Anjane? And then he proceeded to tell me, and he added Old English to it, and the resonance of Old English was magical. Uh, he added Old French, and I was just stunned by this young girl who was four years old, who was a traveling scholar. She, you know, by the time she was nine, she spoke 12 languages. She was going around the royalty. And I was telling people that she actually existed, and her name was eradicated. Uh, there were several reasons for it. But I was trying to tell people, no, 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 her name really did exist. And so we did a Google search, couldn't find it. And a friend did Ancestry.com and she actually found the name. And it's nowhere, anywhere in Google. It sounds like Anjane, sounds like a nice French name, but uh, it was eradicated throughout history. So I decided to connect it. And once I connected, I started having these odd dreams, okay. and these premonitions. And there was one, the, you know, I actually got to talk to her. And what she told me just absolutely blew my mind. I'm like, there is no way. And when I was having these dreams, I was going, you realize I'm going to Google this stuff as soon as I wake up. It's because I want to see if, you're if this is any weird just dream of my head as compared to that. And the first thing was I said, Okay, the, the boat Anjane traveled on, which it was about the 12th century. I said, I do know Columbus's boats were like 50 to 70 feet. So there's no way you had a boat 365 feet. I said, no, it was 365. I said, it was not. I'm Googling. I had an argument in my dream. <laughs> and then I Googled it. The largest boat at that time was 379 feet. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even know they had boats. No. I. I didn't know that either. So I'm like, okay, you got my attention now. And uh, then the other question I asked was, um, tea in England came around, the big tea trade came around in like the 1700s, but they were drinking tea way back then. And I'm saying, wait a second, I Google this and I already know this, and this is in my dream. You did not have that many tea. And then the voice came, he goes, do you think the trade routes from Ethiopia all the way to Scandinavia, you don't think the English and the French ever even tried the tea and the spices that were going back and forth? And I'm like, okay, you won. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was the genesis of, of me continuing the book. And then when I was uh, you know, having these dreams on it, I started writing and I started seeing this girl and it was stunning on what she did her character, her class, everything mm -hmm. she did was, was right. And I was like, people should know about her. 
because we have all of these movies where I'm going to bash Hollywood for a second. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Fine. <laughs> you have like these movies, um, critique Hollywood. Uh, you have these movies like, you know, Crunchy Man, Smacky Man, Bitey Man. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to name the names. Yeah. And it's yeah, Crunchy yeah. Man beats up bad guys, sleeps with Crunchy Woman. She gets <laughs> kidnapped. He frees her at the end, right? Isn't that 85% of everything coming out? And they said, well, we need to empower a woman. So you have Crunchy Woman, beats up bad guy, sleeps with Crunchy Man. They both get kidnapped and then they get freed. I'm like, suppose you have intelligence above a limp ball. <laughs> How are you supposed to enjoy these movies? Sorry, but I so want a shirt that says Crunchy Woman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway no you're so right please keep on i love yeah, it yeah yeah and it's yeah. it's just it's ridiculous because i was actually talking to my doctor yesterday an indian guy and he was like i can't watch movies anymore i want something uplifting i want something that i can go you know you know that's fun and happy you know and i can't even turn on the tv anymore and i i get it i get it yeah, so yeah. here I always hated the horror films where the evil's still lurking. And I'm like, when are they ever going to show the good? When are we ever, ever, ever going to show the power of the good? Yeah. So then I already had the, the screenplay. Like, like I said, you, you could check it. It's, I, I already copyrighted it. Unprotected. So it was, it was this evil, <laughs> evil non-existent. And then they call... Um, the spirit of Andre for help. And you see it in the book and you're like, whoa, uh, it just get, it sent chills down my own spine to connect these two. Yeah. And then because she's such a cute kid and then she becomes so powerful and we're not, I was chatting with a very prominent uh, producer, a big, big, big. And I told her, I said, I don't think Hollywood is ready for um, uh, Anjane. I don't mm -hmm. think she, I don't think she's ready for Anjane. So I'm I was just looking at uh, you know trying to um, uh, 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 convince her to take a look at the book, and she says, "Oh, I definitely want to read the book." So she she says it's on her list. But one of the things that uh, I I try to tell people is this woman was real. <laughs> she did exist. She was that smart as a kid, as a traveling scholar. So this is something that I really took pride in doing. And one of the things was I felt like, oh, I don't want to do this like category of this pro-Christian category. I'm not against it. Um, you know, totally, you know, um, I'm, I'm open to that, believe in that. But I didn't want to be that C.S. Lewis type of writer. And bam, that, that just happened from last book. This is, so I had to study. I was born more atheistic and um, you, nobody in the family was, had any religious or spiritual background. And uh, uh, I had to study um, Catholicism actually <laughs> to write this book <laughs> and i was like what what and one of the odd things i, that I, was, I love that carl i just love your story keep going yeah oh, one of the okay. odd things is i had to um uh learn about this and i could not believe how many catholic churches were continually burned down i was researching this and even in the area that I, you know, um, in Calais, I was looking in the area. And as I go back in time, all the things the professor was talking about was true. But they were all of these, this church burned down, this church, and they rebuilt it, burned it down, rebuilt it. I'm like, what was the national pastime of Europe to burn down Catholic churches? I just never seen anything like it. So I got more intrigued. You know, I got more intrigued about the whole thing. So then I, I, um, I continued to do study, study, and I sent it to, you know, a friend of mine who is very much a Catholic. She goes, this is right online with everything. you're. I can't believe how much you're learning. 
because everything that that professor told you, everything from your dreams are right on right on the money. And I'm like, wow. So I was just really um, uh, uh, taken back by doing this. So there were times that I was even crying writing the book because she was she was something that we are are missing in our society. Yes. You know, yes. you know, uh, her whole thing was put God first, put God first, put God first. You got to have a moral code when you go through life. And and so I'm I'm listening to to this girl and this is what the professor told me. And I was I put it aside cuz I didn't want to write it. And here I am attaching it to a horror film and now you have respect for a good for the good side. You do you're like I tell people, yeah, don't mess with the bad side, but don't mess with that good side either. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be on the other end of that. I have a few notes here. Um, this whole thing with the empowerment, um, knowledge is the empowerment. Okay. It's always been. Yeah. It's always been. Wisdom has always been sought out after. And today we've dummy down so many things from the school system. I can't even believe the world we live in right now. I feel like I woke up in a novel myself. Yeah. yeah. And, and when we're seeing these things, I'm like, where where is that thirst for knowledge and when she did that she she gained so much favor by her love of knowledge so i think she would be a perfect like i, I was telling my friend who was an editor on a gene i said if i were a lost girl like 12 13 years old and i didn't know which way to turn i pick up this book and follow on today i really would mm -hmm. yeah i mean i, I would i would just do that because your focus on good, your focus on God, your focus on study, 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 learn, not just to, to pass a test, learn. And then you you impress people with your knowledge. And that's that's really was the genesis of this. So when I connected the the horror film with this, the and and it just naturally, it just flowed. I kept telling my friend Gene, Andre, this is not even my book anymore. I'm just having dreams of just writing this stuff down, uh, you know, uh, in between all the stuff the professor taught me. And I'm checking it and, and Googling it because I didn't even trust my own dreams. I even told the person <laughs> my dream, I'm Googling this. I hope you know, because I don't believe you. And uh, that was the skeptic in me. And then I just started, it just flowed perfectly. And this time, you know, I decided, uh, uh, I bought the um, the Mac and the, uh, the, uh, the software for, uh, the book design, and I just did the whole thing myself. I didn't want anybody else messing with it. Right. I just, um, I, 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 I just say yes to what he said. Right. Um, this book is powerful. So, as a, you know, Reiki master. By the way, I love the fact you got a Reiki master in the book. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, real, what I'm going to call real healers the real deal real deal we'll talk more about that after the break uh for those people listening but i could feel uh, the power in this book and anjane came to me so i i'm real clear that you have tapped into something with this book and i i want to i want to say this to the listening audience so the story mm. of anjane uh, is true it's true and and I love I love you sharing how you researched that and how you brought that forward. But the, I think her she wanted her story to come forward, and then you very adeptly wove it into uh, it's it's truth in a fiction book, right? Because you have brought a storyline in, so we can follow uh, how it how it works out in now time, which I think is imperative. By the way, I think that's the point, right? So when we talk about uh, the medieval or the dark ages of France, uh, and then we you connect it with the now ages, <laughs> uh, you know, because I'm always asking people, are we enlightened or are we in the dark ages? What are we doing? Second here? dark ages. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, too. Like I was thinking when you were talking about all these child protégés, like we have all these amazing children like that are artists. They come out and they're artists or they're uber smart kids, you know, that are like at 
you know, six years old working with nuclear energy or something. And we have a tendency, and I like how you brought this out in the book to where Anjanae's father would just say, just go along with people. They're going to think you're like a little puppy. And they're like, oh, she's so adorable. She's so cute. We're going to pick her up. She's only four years old. And then she speaks like, you know, six languages or whatever the heck it is she's doing at that age. And, and they're like, oh, but they still treat her like a little puppy. And so she's always saying, well, you know, you got to act like a little puppy, right? And I, I, I was thinking to myself, do we do that to children nowadays? And perhaps we do. Um, you and I are of an age that, I mean, I was raised to respect my elders and, you know, sit up straight at the table and, you know, greet people and, and, and don't slouch around, right? You know, and, and, and please, I'm not just bashing on all the youth because I think there's a lot of great youth out there. But I do know that a lot of people have lost their way. And perhaps it is too much screen time or it's a lack of, as you said, where is the passion for learning? Where is the desire to be greater than you are or to evolve yourself? You know, um, I am a, I'm a lifelong learner. Like my joke is that if I could stay up late at night and read dusty leather bound books that are in some weird language <laughs> with a flashlight and a magnifying glass, I'm so happy. Like, Oh, great. Here we go. <laughs> Right. But there's there's something in this uh, book that I think calls us to really take a look at what it is that we are doing. And um, just a teaser, and then we're going to take a little station break. And you also bring out very clearly the dangers of false friends or being too trusting or giving away your power. Right. Which is which is a big part of the book at some level. So uh, my guest today, Carl David Blake, I hope you're enjoying this interview as much as I am. Just get the book on Janae and please do not, I mean this, do not cast the main spell in this book. It is, it's the real deal. And this, it's, it's a very fascinating read. It's well-written uh, like, but for me, it's right up my alley. I was just riveted and I, I don't know. It's what I do every day, right? It's just the regular day. So uh, this is Loretta Brown and with Carl David Blake, his book on Janae, the most powerful woman who ever lived. And we're going to take a little station break. We'll be right back. All right. All clear. Yeah. What do trees make you think of? Life, longevity, health? There's a reason for that. They're the building blocks of our ecosystems, capable of restoring land and environment while creating stable food systems and economic opportunity. At Trees for the Future, for 30 years, we've worked with smallholder farmers in developing countries to establish sustainable agroforestry methods. Where there was once deforestation and poor agricultural practices, there are now thriving microenvironments we call forest gardens, made up of more than 50 species of trees and dozens of shrubs, fruits, and vegetables. Through Trees for the Future's forest garden approach, thousands of farming families have successfully brought their land back to life. A sustainable solution to hunger, poverty, and climate change. Sponsored by Trees for the Future. You're invited to join the movement at trees.org slash radio. Energy is powerful. It's all around us, mysterious, full of potential. Directing positive healing energy to raise your vibrational rate through Reiki can change your life. Reiki master Loretta Brown has relieved stress, sadness, anger, and even helped clients lose weight, stop smoking, and end sleep disorders. Worldwide, people have sought out Reiki Oasis. If you want help with your dis-ease, visit ReikiOasis.com. Harness life's energy. Visit ReikiOasis.com today. It's time that you are heard, and I don't mean in just a conversation. I mean really heard. Imagine hosting your very own radio program on Alternative Talk 1150. Talk about being heard. Call 425-653-1150 right now to learn how affordable it can be to host your own radio show. Time slots are going fast, so take hold of this chance by dialing 425-653-1150. Alternative Talk, we have an opportunity waiting just for you. Alternative Talk 1150, here to uplift your day. Yeah. 
I hate to interrupt on you there, buddy. I got to bring you guys back in. All right, stand by. Welcome back to the original Loretta Brown show. And um, with my guest, Carl David Blake, I am Loretta Brown. You can find out more about me at ReikiOasis.com. These shows are archived. You can download them and listen to them over and over at the KKNW 1150 AM archives for the original Loretta Brown show. And of course, we're on iTunes, Podcast One, Megaphone, um, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud. I don't know. Uh, Just Google it. You'll find it. And uh, you are going to want to get this book on Janae, the most powerful woman that ever lived, which is she really lived. Yeah, she really lived. We were talking during the break about how she's influenced us. I was sharing with Carl that reading this book has influenced me. And I I think it's it's very timely. Um, So the world out there has got all kinds of things going on. I do see people have kind of lost their way a little bit, like not quite sure what to do. And without getting too preachy with everybody, um, I I think sometimes people are just seeking pleasure. Like a lot of people come to me and they go, I just want to feel good all the time. And I don't want anything that makes me not feel good, right? And I'm like, but we're growing. So sometimes there's going to be some growth pains perhaps or some things um so carl during the break you were talking a little bit about anjane and and that she's kind of an inspiration and i know people haven't read the book right because it's just out there but what are some of the qualities that she embodies i liked what you (laughs) said that she doesn't negotiate with evil i was going to ask you to uh, uh, uh what we talked about on the break to, to expand on that, because I, what I didn't even think about that. She doesn't negotiate with evil. So in the work that I do, which um, is indefinable, right? Um, I do a lot of things to help people release old things and break out or, or get rid of old habits or, or whatever. But one of the things that I'm very aware of is that not everything that's affecting people is coming from them. So if you could say it's an evil or it's a it's a negative thought forms, it's some, something outside of them. There are generational, quote unquote, curses. There are things that come down through our lineages. And I have always been that person that there's something that will uh, call it God, call it whatever that. Uh, and for for people listening, those that are true workers will know what I'm talking about. There comes a point where you just do not negotiate with it. You do not co- uh, communicate with it. You don't have a conversation. You don't need to know what it needs. It's out of there, right? And so I recognize that in Anjane, that there's this point. And in your story, I'll bring I'll bring Anjane in. You've got a scene where she has a godson, Gabriel, who is, I don't know if he's three, two, he's little, little tiny guy. And Anjane is 11. And she's very adept at uh, sword play. And and she's been taught all of that as well as all of the academics. And this woman shows up with this very fierce, mean dog that is going to kill this child. Like, it's really clear the dog's going to go for it. And Anjane just steps in there and takes care of it. That's what I'm going to say. She just takes care of it. And so that's where my comment came from was that she is not negotiating with evil. She's like, no, that's it. So where in ourselves do we find this fierceness, you know, this rightness, this, you know, stand your groundness. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where I was coming from with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, Mm -hmm. that non-negotiating with evil or negativity, or what's wrong, whatever, how you want to look at it. I'm seeing that less and less in society today. People, you know, uh, yeah. don't have that strong um, moral compass. And that affects everything and everybody. One of the, uh, you know, 
a friend of mine was in the military for over 30 years. And he, I, I said, why did you stay, you know, when you could have gotten out at 25? He says, he says, you know, the worst battle is emotionally when you can't trust people around you. When I was in the military, I knew everybody. I would rather go to war with men who are willing to die for me than go to an office and get backstabbed all day long. <laughs> and I, I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah. I related to it. Yeah. I related to it. <laughs> so, well, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I, I get that. And, and that's how it affects everybody around you when you're like that. And, um, we're seeing that more so, more so. A, a friend of mine said, he's in his 20s. And I said, what's the difference between you and your parents' generation? He goes, we don't have a definition of hero. We can't relate to anything that doesn't um, benefit us. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, I don't even know what to say about that. Loretta, what do you think? <laughs> Well, I, I'm listening to what you're saying, and it kind of alludes back to something I said before the break, that in this book, you do talk about um, the dangers of false friends who can lead you really astray. And there was a, a comment that was in the book, and, and you, you repeated it a couple of times throughout the story. And that's the point that I'll just use the word demons, right? I'll just use that word. Uh, use jealousy. And to really get in there, like that's one of the biggest things they use. And then and then that leads to betrayal. And like you say, you can't trust that people really have your back. Do they really have your back? Um, are they competing? You know, we're in a very competitive world. And so, like you say, yeah, I'd rather go to battle with those guys than go to work and be backstabbed all day. Right. So it, it does, it does bring into, like I said, it's a big conversation, but the, the moral compass, do we have that moral compass uh, in, in the book? Um, as you're reading through the story, you really, really get the idea of what is required to show up in that manner and to really have each other's backs and to, and to come together as a community that is dedicated toward these higher ideals, right? And I kind of think people thirst for it. I, it. My experience is that people are seeking either connection or God or, or some sort of a higher way of being um, that at some point they get bored with their life, you know? And um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it, it there's mm -hmm. also something to be said about wisdom, you know, mm -hmm. and e even in the Bible, you know, uh, with Solomon, and you, even Andre mentions it in there that the thirst for wisdom I don't see on people today like I did when I was in college. I used to love college. I used to love the idea of sitting in a classroom with one of the, you know, a great scientist, world famous, and listening to them lecture. You know, when Jordan Peterson is going around the world, I, you know, and I, I, I definitely like the guy, but he, when I was in college, there was a Jordan Peterson in every, every college in the country. There was a, there was a hundred of them at every single college. He wasn't anything special, but we've dumbed down our society so much. Uh -huh that there's one man going around talking about these things. And I, I used, I was trying to tell people there were 5 million Jordan Petersons. Yes, they're important. Yes, they're wonderful. But what happened to them? You know, how do we get rid of all of them in school? So there's like this anti-learning. We're definitely in the second dark ages. And when you're starting to see that, you know, Andre being a traveling scholar, and then you have Jordan Peterson traveling, and then you have um, uh, people paying to see them outrageous money when there should be those at every single uh, community college, every single college. So that's something that I kind of scratch away because I love learning. I've learned learning new things. I just uh, I joined another French club so I could start learning French because I never learned it fluently. Uh, yeah, I love learning new things and doing new things and interacting with uh, you know, one of my favorite things is have breakfast with my friends 
and just chat for hours. You know, yeah, yeah. I was I was downtown. Yeah. I was at yeah, there. Yeah. You know, four yeah. hours chatting with a friend. You don't see that everybody's on their phone. Everybody is distracted. You know, from the person that's right in front of them. And uh, I don't think that um, people see each other as valuable. And it hit me the other day. It hit me. I was with a friend. I'm like. Do you think that a lot of these people are, are on their phone also because they have nothing to say? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm starting to believe that these people, a lot of these people just, they don't study. They're not excited about learning new things. They'll go overseas just to, you know, they go to Italy to snap some good pictures. But uh, there, there's, the, what do you call those people in Italy? Oh, Italians, right? <laughs> you may want to interact with the Italians instead of just having pictures for yourself. Well, you, you know, know um, a, a while back, you know, I, you know, Amit Goswami, I had him on the show and he said the, the average attention span is one and a half seconds. So how can you possibly give a lecture to people who can only listen for one and a half seconds? And I think that uh, you know, we need to redevelop that ability. Um, the in 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 your book, Anjane, you know, like I feel like she's the protector of scholars or education or something like this importance for intellectuals to be protected and for our our right to have that conversation. Or um, the other thing I was thinking is in the book, many of the things that she was able to overcome, even at such a quote young age, was through her her learning. So she learned all these languages, like it's crazy. So she could speak fluently in all these languages. She wrote a diary that went from language to language and used nuance and symbols, symbol, the language of symbols. Like, you know, that's a powerful language that takes scholarly adeptness. Even her fighting skills, she was able to overcome some of these attacks from whoever because of her learning. And I think that that is just something that can't be emphasized enough. Yeah. 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 It's, it's her <laughs> thirst for knowledge was unbelievable, but you know, and she always knew that her time was limited on the planet, but the protector of the intellect, I just had this conversation before with somebody and uh, I, we don't honor teachers. They're the most important profession because every profession depends on it. Uh, you know, like when you, you, you're you teaching Reiki to maybe, uh, you know, beginning Reiki masters, uh, you know, it's it's you, the teacher. It starts all with the teacher. It always started with the teacher. And yeah. once we didn't honor that, um, it's we, we, we got lost. You know, one of my favorite movies was The Dead Poets Society. OK, uh, a long yeah, time yeah. ago. That's a long time ago. That's a quarter century ago. But when you looked at what they were learning, <laughs> you know, they were learning, everybody learned Latin. It was like 62, everybody learned Latin in those days. You know, when I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who's a retired doctor, his generation before mine, he was born in like the 40s, uh, uh, early 40s. And he was saying that all Americans spoke, obviously English with competency exams, a uh, Latin four years with competency exams, Greek three years with competency exams, and a language you chose. So the average high school student who graduated in any reasonable area was able to speak four languages. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I uh, don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we we took the easy route. We 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 said rights, and we you know we we got rid of responsibility. But so. I think people are thirsting for those intelligent conversations and yeah. they really want them because when I talk, um, I hear, I see people all around me listening to my conversation. You know, I was having a really intense conversation mm -hmm. when I was in Los Angeles down in Redondo beach. And this one woman walked over to me and my two buddies and said, Oh, I have to apologize, but I was listening to your entire conversation. Yours was more interesting than ours. And I found that very interesting. But I, when I was in Los Angeles, people would tape my conversations with their phones like this. And um, I was like, come on, guys, you know, the victory, you know, uh, I have your own conversation because I think they would just look for ideas. But I, it, to be around that 
academy like in Greece, where it started with the with the original university started. These were great men and women getting around in a circle and exchanging ideas. That's how you learn. Andre was a traveling scholar. That's how you learned in those days. Yeah. You, know, you, you think like, uh, uh, just think about something that, where you would go 20 miles. That was a long way by horseback. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was a long way. So you learned like if somebody who was like in the Portland area and it was the 1700s, they would come over to your house and they would tell you what Portland was like, right? Because maybe you weren't there. Or you, you know, you didn't yeah. want to take the ride. That's how we learned through the traveling scholars. That's why they were so important. The elite loved them. And, you know, you saw the movie Amadeus when he was also a traveling scholar. He had he had students, but you know, he they would teach each other's kingdoms, and that's why the elite held the knowledge mostly because they exchanged their scholars because they were the only ones who could afford it. When the yeah. Renaissance hit, that's when the middle class moved up. And that's, do you real? I, I, I'm going to tell you a statistic that's going to be mind boggling. Uh, do you like dogs? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The average vocabulary during the Renaissance, that's the rebirth of knowledge, was 250 words. The Average vocabulary of the border collie is over 750 words. <laughs> I love that. Yep. Yes. And the yep. border collies, they, they've, they, uh, there was one when Neil deGrasse Tyson was interviewing a border collie who had over a thousand word vocabulary. It was stunning. But I will just want you to think how crazy that is. This yeah. is a species of another, uh, another species. And today, these top 10 dogs have a larger vocabulary than the Reaper. That means that before the Renaissance, Fluffy <laughs> <laughs> clearly had a better grasp of any language than the than 80% of all the people that ever lived before 1700. That's great. So, so this is, this is something very new for us. And I don't know if we could handle the intelligence that we're, we're seeing. You know, the libraries are full of books, right? And no, I've never seen anybody get grabbed out of a library and thrown into a club. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it should be the other way around. Yeah. But so that thirst, and this is what Anjane brought up. This is mm -hmm. the power that she's yeah. bringing up. Plus the symbolism that she used. She could look at any, she could tell you anything what's going on in any room based on the artwork, based on the people's uh, body language. She was just on, like she was on another eight levels, you know? Yeah. So yeah. to have her at that time when most of the people did not have the vocabulary of the border collie or, or the top 10 dogs, it was even more stunning on what she did. So you could you, you you see this. One of the one of the issues that that we had as a species going back is that we were basically most of the people were illiterate. It wasn't that long that we yes. essentially sure. defeated illiteracy. So and we only did that because of the teacher. So yeah. that's really, that's really what, you know, I, I, when I read, you know, sometimes I'll take a look at the book and there's certain scenes in there that, you know, when the professor was telling me and I do, I'm writing the sequel because I know who her grandmother Good. was and the whole oh, thing that's going there. Can't wait. And what happened um, with, how did she end up there? Because she was more uh, Middle Eastern, more like uh, she came from is an Islamic princess. So uh, w one of her lineage. So it, it was really very, very interesting on how they made it through Greece, how they uh, uh, integrated throughout Europe, uh, uh, this, this delightful little girl. And I wish the world would take a look at her and read this and see what is her message. Yeah, and yeah. Right now, um, when I'm looking at, uh, like I said, I find it odd that I'm study, studying Catholicism. And um, when I was reading 
this article that said the number one rising book in the world is Revelation. And I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. But I was like, here, I'm reading it for the for Anjanae's book. And, you know, several other people that helped me with it were like, wow, I'm taking a look at some of these things because it's all symbolism. But when you look at uh, uh, the symbolism and reading people's body language, that's just critical everywhere you go. So I don't know. I was going to ask you, are th- where does she fit in to um, like the greats, you know, on the spiritual side? Because she's on, she was obviously on another level. And there were probably other people around the world that could have been like her. I can't imagine anybody could touch her as far as intelligence knowledge at that young age to be able to do that. I don't know if anybody could touch that. So um, is, is there any other people in history that you would relate her to, or is she just in, in, just in the, the class by herself? Um, I think she is in a class by herself, but I also know, like I said, what's coming to me, and I was thinking about this earlier, is that we we always have a group of, I'm going to say, protégés coming. So if you look at like Mozart, like a musical protégé, right? And you look at what she brought, but I also, uh, but I also think she's unique. Maybe we don't have the communication or the ability, like maybe many of their names were wiped out from history, sort of like hers, which, by the way, without giving away the ending, you give great insight into the fact that mm, we actually do know about her, but with a different name and watered down version. So I kind of think that that's what's been going on. So somebody that powerful, someone that knowledgeable, and um, that some and someone that stood up to everything that was going on and and sort of defied it, you know, did her own thing. Um, I think they would want to erase that because it's too empowering to the people, right? It's too empowering. So I think she is back again because we need her. And I would rather suspect that as you begin to uncover things about her, that we'll have a clearer picture of who she she really was, as they say, who she really was. Uh, for the listeners, I want to uh, let you know that this book is also got love story in it. Um, it brings forward it to me uh, what happens when a blessed woman, um, you know, brings uh, and activates her loving and healing abilities because there's a contrast between her and her mother, who's very greedy and is a witch and is working with dark energies to try to get money and fame and power, which is a thing. And then you also bring in this idea about love, love and loyalty, and that um, without love and loyalty, uh, no religion or spiritual enlightenment really has any meaning. So it's that world of love. So that I could, man, I could probably talk to you a long time. Maybe we should do it off air, but I have my own ideas about Anjane and uh, I, I'm just like thrilled you brought the book out there. And um, Carl David Blake, what's the last thing you want to say to the audience? I know, and I can't wait for your other book. Please let me know when it's ready. Uh, I'm I, ready. And, I would, and the third I would one. say that. And the third one, I want that one too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, I would say, uh, Anjane, if I were a young girl confused in the world, I would run, I would pray to God and I would run towards Anjane as fast as I could in this yeah. world. I really yeah. would. I just never seen one of the things in there. I just wanted to, I don't think anybody loved more than she did. That's, it wasn't just her fighting skills, it was her love. That's what made her so powerful too. Her wisdom, her love, and then you didn't want to mess with her. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't, like I said, I don't want to be too preachy, but there's a verse in the Bible, no greater love than uh, the one that gives their life for another. Yeah. So Carl David Blake and uh, what's your uh, website? Carl David it's- Blake publications or something uh, carl david blake productions productions uh, dot com yes all right thank you so much everybody on Janae, the most powerful woman who ever lived and maybe she's still alive hmm, at some level have a wonderful week enjoy your weekend and it's love 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 thank you so much mr benny carl david blake we got to talk i wish i could come to those morning coffees anyway love, oh, love. thank you yes, for, yes definitely
We'll talk to you next time.